Thank you and hello again, everybody, and welcome back here to another Bob and Ray show. Hello. <laughs> we'll be here for 45 minutes with five minutes out for news someplace. Uh, I don't know whereabouts, but they'll tell us before the show is over. Is that the I'm news sure. that we taped this morning about 10.30? Yeah. Well, anyway, let's get going first with another one of our patented copyrighted features. And now, the Kraftweiler Industrial Cartel, producers of all sorts of stuff, made out of everything, invite you to... Widen your horizon. Yes, it's time once again for Widen Your Horizons, the award-winning public service program that teaches you to lead a fuller and happier life by acquiring new skills. Our subject for today is how to use dental floss, and here to lead the discussion is Mr. Sheldon Blight of the Old Orchard Dental Floss Company. I assume I'm correct, Mr. Blight, in saying that your firm is one of the largest in the world. Yes, we turned out some 18,000 miles of dental floss in 1956. Now, that was an increase of about 3,500 miles over the preceding year. Uh-huh. And our president, Mr. Boxall, is aptly described as the floss king of the free world. Well, does that mean that there may be bigger dental floss plants behind the Iron Curtain? Well, it's hard to say. Radio Moscow contends that the state-owned dental floss plant in Leningrad is producing 30,000 miles a year. But I doubt it. Mm -hmm. I just don't believe they have the know-how. Now, you were telling me just before the broadcast that a lot more dental floss would be sold in this country if people... Uh, knew how to use it. What did you mean by that? Well, the American people lose enough food, vitamins, and minerals between their teeth each day to feed the entire nation of Vietnam and part of Cambodia. And only about 6% of this food is ever removed with dental floss. Boy, I, I had no idea that figure was so small. Well, now the average person thinks that in order to run dental floss back and forth between his teeth, he must get one hand completely inside his mouth. Yeah. Now, this is an erroneous idea. Now, my mouth is of average dimensions, and I have no trouble using dental floss at all. Well, now, I think we should, uh, should get right along with the demonstration here and see how this is done. Well, we? well, now, the first step is to break off a piece of dental floss about nine inches long and form a small loop at the point where you intend to insert it between the teeth. I'll explain that Mr. Blight has broken off the dental floss, and now he's forming the loop. There it is. Now, you see, I put the floss between the teeth, keeping both hands outside the mouth. Then I run it back and forth. Oh. What's wrong, uh, Mr. Blake? Well, uh, we're running it through my lower tea. I got it caught in a crown. Of, uh, it needs to tie up the lower together. Well, it has, I guess. It seems seems to have a double granny knot in it there, too. I certainly never saw anything like that before. Uh, I read about it once in a treasure. I think it could happen. I stuck tight, too. Uh huh. Hey, stop. There's a dentist up on the next floor. Why don't you go up and uh, see if he can help you? I ought to do that. I hope he doesn't have to fool any teeth to get me on tight. I'm sorry it turned oh, out this way. Right. You've been listening to Widen Your Horizons, and our guest speaker today was Mr. Sheldon Blight of the Old Orchard Dental Floss Company. Free copies of Mr. Blight's remarks may be obtained from your local representative of the Croftweiler Industrial Cartel. Okay, so much for that. Now, let's get along to our next feature. Now, the makers of Tingle, the wintergreen-flavored dental floss, invite you to join us for another thrilling adventure of Elmer W. Litzinger, Spy. Hello there. I'm Elmer W. Litzinger, Spy. My most recent assignment carried me to a small waterfront bar in Lisbon. My government had reason to suspect that the place was a clearinghouse for international agents passing military secrets back and forth through the Iron Curtain. The bar seemed quiet enough as I entered, a few seamen drinking ale in one corner, an old man resting on his cane by the front door, and then suddenly an exotic brunette came in and stepped up to the bar. I had a hunch she might be the person I was looking for. See, si, senorita, something for you? I hear the weather has been very clear this week in the Canary Islands. Ah, senorita, you know the password. The 
Apparently, you have information for me to pass along to regional headquarters. Yes, listen carefully. I have succeeded in getting secret American documents. They show that the United States now has 47 submarines in the Mediterranean. Hey, 47 is more than we thought, senorita. You have done well. Uh, pardon me, I hate to break into your conversation, but I am Elmer W. Litzinger, spy. I couldn't help overhearing, and you're all wet, lady. We have 63 submarines in the Mediterranean. Oh, so you are a spy, you say? For which side, senor? I am with the United States government. Here are my credentials. The picture there was taken when I still had my mustache. But I'm sure you'll see the resemblance. See, si, senor. You are what you say you are. Perhaps you may even know something about aircraft carrier strength in the Suez area. Yes, we have three of them down there, but don't just let me babble on this way. I'm sure that you and the lady have things to talk about. There'll be plenty of time for that later, senor. We do not meet the gentlemen of your professional background often. Uh, what about American atomic power in the Middle East? Well, all of the carriers have A-bombs aboard. Several of the submarines do, too. I could send over a map showing their location. We'll be most appreciative, <clears throat> senor. Well, gee, it uh, sure is nice to meet friendly people so far away from home. Won't you have a glass of wine with me? There's still some in the bottle over on my table. No, thank you, senor. It has been poisoned. Well, okay, then. Incidentally, uh, I'll have to file something with Washington about you people. That's what I was sent here for. I wonder if you'd be good enough to uh, give me your name. Of course, senor. I am number 723. And I am number 812. But people who know her well just call her 8. 723 and 812. Well, this is the meaty kind of stuff that good spy reports are made of. I'll get a cable off to Washington immediately. I'll just say, the case of the Lisbon Bar closed successfully by Elmer W. Litzinger, spy. Friends, if your gums always seem warmer during the spring and summer months, why not cool off with Tingle, the wintergreen-flavored dental floss? Try some soon. You'll be glad you did. The adventures of Elmer W. Litzinger, spy, have been brought to you by the Tingle Twine and Floss Company. Portions of this program were manually reproduced. And down here in our studio audience, we're going to say hello to some of the folks who come from various places to see us, and we're always happy to see them, certainly, aren't we, Ray? And uh, first of all... What, Bob? I wasn't listening. I said we're very always happy to see these oh, uh, people. Okay, but look, don't include me in the conversations, will you? I'm way up on the stage. I know. You're out in the audience. <clears throat> it's the only chance I get to wainscot the walls. Okay. Could I have your name, please, sir? Yes. My name is Frank L. Diddy. And uh, what's the unusual occupation that you have, Mr. Diddy? Well, I'm a professional splasher. You mean you work at a swimming pool or what? No, I'm employed by several New York dry cleaning companies, whose names I'd prefer not to mention. And whenever we have a rain, it's my job to drive through puddles and splash as many pedestrians as I can. Well, uh, in other words, this creates more business for the dry cleaners, huh? You know, you've got a good head on your shoulders to figure that out. Well, the whole thing seems like kind of a dirty trick, but you seem very proud of yourself. Well, it's really quite an art. Now, you've got to hit the puddles at just the right angle to get the maximum effect, and that takes plenty of practice. Well, you know, it seems to me that a splash is pretty much of a splash, no matter how you do it. Well, no, that's not the case at all. Now, you have to be sure that the muddy water will hit the portion of the person's clothing that has to be dry cleaned. Now, if you go through a puddle too far out in the street, you'll just ruin his shoes. If you come in too close to the curb, you might splash mud all over his face and miss the clothing entirely. Well, you can only do your work in rainy weather, then, I take it. You must have some pretty long layoffs during the dry spells. Well, huh? splashing is the big thing with me, but my employers manage to keep me busy most of the time. On a clear day, for example, I go around to restaurants and bump the arms of waiters. They're causing them to drop the food they're carrying? And... Oh, they drop it all right, but... If you get your timing down pad, you can be pretty sure that they'll drop in somebody's lap. And, of course, that means more dry cleaning. That's right. If I can, I try to find the waiter who's carrying a tray full of soup. Now, soup soaks into the clothing very well and leaves a nice stain. Well, I can't say I really approve of this work you're doing, but I want to thank you for coming up on our stage and telling us about it. I wonder if you'd care to sign our guest book before you leave. Uh, this book right here? That's right. You just put your name right beneath uh, Noel Coward's there, about right? Oh, I'm terribly oh. sorry. I was awfully clumsy of me. Oh, now you spilled ink over my suit, all over the book. I don't think I'll ever be able to get this Oh, out. a good dry cleaner can fix that up for you. Here's the address of one in the neighborhood. Just take the suit over there and tell him I sent you. Okay. Thanks again, and goodbye. Goodbye. Now, 
now it's time for Mr. Trace, keener than most persons, in the case he calls the stolen false teeth murder clue. The scene is in Mr. Trace's private office as he calls for his assistant, Spike Delancey. Yes, boss, did you call? Yes, Spike. I've been having trouble, as you probably have been able to see. Saints preserve us, boss. Your smile is different. Someone, Spike, has stolen my prosthetic appliance. You don't say, boss, that you were without your teeth. That's exactly what I say, Spike. Well, who would... Who would want your teeth, boss? I don't... No, who could pull a dastardly trick like this? Where did you last see them, Bart? Well, I had lunch at the lunch counter downstairs. Then I came up to the office, and about a half hour later, I noticed that they were missing. Saints preserve us, boss. There's only one clue, Spike. Yes, sir. This set of fingerprints on the edge of my desk. Saints preserve us, boss. Fingerprints on the edge of your desk. Yes, I want you to run through our file and see if you can place them with any of the criminals we've dealt with in the past. All right, boss, I'll be right back. Just as soon as I check through the file, see if I can match up those, boss. That's what I want you to do, Spike. Well, if I could only find those, I could get back to my job of crime detecting. Oh, any luck, Spike? Turn around, pally, you say. What, what? Who are you? What do you want here? You, lurking there behind the gray curtains covering my window. Why you, you, with the dagger in your hand. You look so insipid the way you talk. Insipid, you say? Yes. You don't look like the old Mr. Keenly who's tracer than most persons. I'm as traced as any lost person. You're a person. And I'll be people if you're going to trace around here, Lost. I certainly think you're barking up the wrong tree. Just a moment, people. I've traced you long enough. From now on, I'm keen. Keen to it all. You've lost to that, people? Yes, I'll purse along with you on that. But wait until my assistant Spike Delancey gets back. He ain't coming back. You mean... He's keen, people. Lost. I'm treated. At last. Today we heard part one of a two-part story from the files of Mr. Trace, keener than most persons. In the case he calls the stolen false teeth murder clue. Say, Bob, Barry Campbell is oh. here to say hello to you and to me and to all his friends across this great oh, nation of our ours. our good old show business friend, Barry Campbell, star of motion pictures, television, radio, orchestra work. Barry, come in here and sit down. Say hello to Ray. All right. Come on. <clears throat> Barry, uh, when did you get in town? And let's have a real old-fashioned gab fest here and just kind of bring ourselves up to date on... On your activities, it's been quite a while. Well, I tell you, uh, bad luck has been dogging my heels, Bob, uh, and all my adventures and enterprises in the last year or so. Oh, you I'm sorry to hear that. My uh, my TV series, The Combat Mess Sergeant, uh, didn't sell, and I sunk all my savings into making a pilot for that thing. Yeah, I know. I heard about that. It, uh... I cashed all my bonds and everything. I. $87.50 went right down the drain. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, actually, uh, I'm a little ahead of my time with that show. It's a little too cerebral. Well, uh, Combat Mess Sergeant, of course, uh, the title alone would rule out a great portion of the viewing public. Bob, uh, the Combat Mess Sergeant, uh, uh, the idea was that he wasn't to be the hero or the Mess Sergeant himself. We were to have a different episode, but it would just uh, happen around the mess tent. Oh, well, all the action would take place there around the boiling pots and kettles and right. but, field stoves. Well, I'd rather not talk about it anymore. What I'm working on now... I see you're still wearing the fatigues that you were going to wear in that... Uh... Got to. I got to. Well, uh, uh, what, what I'm working after on that? now, uh, Bob, is the uh, fourth major league. I'm going to uh, 
fourth major league. Baseball. I'm going to call it the Global League. And working now, we we already have a franchise in Tehran. We got one in Paris going. Good. Yeah. We're trying to work some arrangement to get a team into Moscow, and uh, the Cairo Sphinxes have uh, notified us that there's interest there. Well, that it seems that like Cairo's going to put up a stadium for them. Sounds pretty good, but... The only, uh, uh, the only problem there is they don't know how to play ball, of Isn't uh, sports a little bit far afield for you? I mean, your, your talents seem to lie along the entertainment, uh, well, like movies and acting and the, uh, the well, band Well, no, world. Bob, I've always, uh, knock on wood, oh... <laughs> Uh, I've always uh, kept myself in good physical shape. Well, that you have, although... Uh, and uh, kind of... I was always uh, well-coordinated. And as a youth, uh, I don't mind saying, uh, I was considered uh, one of the better athletes to uh, ever come I guess, out uh, of uh, my hometown. You may be in good shape. I guess the fatigues give you that seedy appearance right now, as if you're kind of falling apart at the seams and uh, going to... Well, pot, I, uh, so if I look lumpy, Bob, it's <clears throat> because I have a bottle of ketchup in this pocket here. Uh -huh. and, uh, and, of course, I have all the contracts for the different teams in, th in this pocket here. And I have a, a toolkit in this pocket. Well, that's... Uh, and I have case a change of uh, socks in the other pocket, which gives me an overall lumpy appearance. In case the bus breaks down, I know that you're still traveling in the Barry Campbell and his orchestra bus. I saw it parked out front when we came in today. What does uh, that green ticket mean? Is that 15 that's fish? That's 15 fish, yes. I, I knew there was more than the yellow one. Yeah. Right. Uh, doesn't the bus attract some attention? You haven't taken any it of the lettering It attracts cops like, uh, like dogs attract uh, fleas. Uh, the minute I park my bus, cops I think wake up and come right out of the doorway, wherever they've been sleeping. I think the expression is the way molasses attracts flies. But we'll let it go at that. Well, I mean, you know your uh, own expressions better than I do. Yeah, well, it's a colloquialism. Uh, so then, uh, as I, besides the, the policemen who are attracted to this bus, uh, you find that uh, people stop you on the street and say, hey, where's the rest of the orchestra, <coughs> Barry Campbell? Eccentrics are uh, attracted to it, too, uh, Bob. I don't believe I've parked for longer than 10 minutes, uh, but what every eccentric in a given town has come by the bus made comments. Say, I wonder if I could interrupt you just uh, briefly. No, I guess I'll wait. Uh, well, Barry, uh, what, will you be leaving for overseas uh, shortly to round up this fourth major league and get Bob, it? I don't have the loot to go overseas. What I'm doing is uh, uh, most of my contact work through mail and through smugglers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, well, if we can be of any assistance uh, uh, to you on a... I know I can uh, depend on you uh, both for any publicity. Well, I don't know whether you can depend on Ray, but... Uh, I'd like to get uh, some, uh, I think... Some city in, in the United States, I think we'd need uh, in this new global well, league. Well, that's going to present all sorts of problems of transportation and uh, expense, expensive travel. I would keep it all within uh, Europe there if I could, if it were me. Well, of course, uh, it it's isn't. not you. No, it isn't, I know. And uh, it's more me than you, and uh, well, I'll have to thank conduct goodness it the for way that, I, huh? huh? I say thank goodness for that. I'll I wouldn't have want to, to be conduct it up. the way I would, uh, mm -hmm. providing... Uh, uh, I have the wherewithal. Sure. Well, okay, I guess we've covered, uh, brought you up to date, and uh, the people up to date on what you've been doing, Barry Campbell, and I hope very soon we'll be seeing your name up there in lights again. Barry. <laughs> rather CD down and out, Barry Campbell, here on his latest visit to our program, but things may look up for him in the future. They better, because uh, he's really... <laughs> He's really in trouble. And now, as a portion of the Bob and Ray Show, we bring you another episode of One Fella's Family. Today's episode, entitled Sweet Remembrance, is taken from book C-L-M-I-X. Chapter XXXII, page two. It's 11 minutes past 11 in the morning as we look in on mother and father who are standing in the kitchen just finishing the breakfast dishes. And we hear the old gaffer say... Yes, yeah, yeah, Fandy, looks like another nice spring day. Soon as we finish the dishes, maybe we should take a walk down by the seawall. Yes, I think the tulips are up now, and practically blooming. Yeah, I see a bank of fog off the junk. horizon. Any old junk? Oh, here comes the junk man, Freddy. Any old junk? 
Right. Right. Looks like he's pulling into the driveway. I haven't seen one of those old rag men in years. No, and we don't have any junk to sell, do we? No, we've thrown out all those things. Oh, he's getting down off the wagon and Everything ringing we... the doorbell. Here. Uh, I'll, go. I'll let him in. Please. All right. Here. Yes. Got any old rags, junk? Yeah, well, my wife, pads. my wife and I were just discussing the fact that we didn't have anything to sell. Give a nickel for the jacket you got on. Huh? This one here? Yeah. You know, I don't think I'd want to sell this. It's a gift from one of the family. I make a buy here. Yeah. You use this stove much? Yeah. Well, every day, three Two times. Two dollars and fifty cents worth for you. Yeah. No, we were commenting we hadn't seen a take junk man out. like take you for some time. <clears throat> Well, wait just a minute there, sir. You can't come in here and take away our stove. I don't think I can give you too much for the table. Well, it's not for sale give me in the a dime. first. You whippersnapper. Get the table, take the dime. Leave the table alone, Fandy. What? These men what? are stealing us out of everything we have here He's in the house. He's paying. He's paying. I know, but it's not enough, Fandy. My word. You want to keep these things for sweet remembrance? About time we get rid of this old junk. You have been listening to another episode of One Fellow's Family. Today's episode, entitled Sweet Remembrance, was taken from book CLMIX, chapter XXXII, page 2. One Fellow's Family is written and produced by T. Wilson Messy. This is a Messy production. You know, each week we receive literally hundreds of letters from souvenir hunters who want some meadow that surely belong to Bob and Ray. Well, naturally, we can't fill all of these requests, but from time to time we are going to give our studio audience a chance to buy at auction some object that belongs to one of us. Today we're offering Ray's hat, a beautiful item that any souvenir collector would be very proud to own. I'm now, sure. you'll notice, neighbors, <clears throat> that this hat is in the fashionable Tyrolean style and that it's a lovely forest green in color. What's more, it bears the initials R.G. inside, which certainly proves that it belongs to Ray. Now, let's begin. What am I bid for this handsome object? I wonder if I could uh, examine the merchandise before the bidding begins. Oh, sure you can, madam. Here, if you just uh, hand the hat down to the lady, uh, Wilbur, thank you. Mm. It's awfully stained around the sweatband. Well, that, of course, proves that the hat uh, actually has been worn not just a surplus item that we picked off some dealer's shelf. That hat has been worn by Ray himself for, well, how long is it, Ray? Now? Well, I've worn this hat almost daily for about eight years. And the Ever lucky since buyer... you started in show business. That's right, it? and the lucky buyer will get a written testimonial to that effect. That's right, a written testimonial verifying the fact that this hat belonged to Ray will go to the buyer. Now, I see that the gentleman across the aisle is examining the hat. Isn't that a lovely piece of merchandise, sir? Well, it wouldn't do me any good. It's a seven and a quarter. I wear four and seven eighths. I have a very small head for a man my size. Yeah, for a man over six feet tall, weighing, I'd say, about a 200 pounds, <coughs> you do have quite a small head. But, of course, you've got to realize that uh, you wouldn't be buying this hat to wear. You'd be buying it as a souvenir, right? Well, I don't know who'd want an old beaten-up hat <coughs> with a stained sweatband as a souvenir, anyway. Well, all right, madam. I'll just assume that you don't know the true value when you see it. Will anybody open the bidding at $50? Do I hear $25 for this authentic Ray Goulding Tyrolean hat? Oh, come on, friends. Don't be bashful. What do I hear as an opening bid? 15 cents. Man with a small head bids 15 cents. And I, I'm sure, sir, you're joking. You couldn't buy the feather in this hat alone for less than half a dollar. Well, uh, I'd have to have it shrunk so much to fit me that I just couldn't afford to pay any more for it. See, they charged me three, four dollars just to shrink it down to a four and seven eighths. Well, we have a bid of 15 cents here. Uh, would anybody care to top that? Well, I'll bid a quarter for it. I hear 25 cents. Madam, I'm sure you don't know what you're saying. The hat is virtually priceless. Ray only buys a new one every eight or ten years, and this means that hats actually owned by Ray Goulding are very, very well, scarce. Well, you see, I want to give it to my nephew, but my stars, you'd have to have it cleaned and blocked. It looks terrible that way. Well, look, we're not putting this item Almost up as... Almost a health menace. It's not an item of wearing apparel. It's a souvenir. Now, who raised the bid from 25 cents? I hear 25 cents once, 25 cents twice, 
Ray, you willing to let this hat go for 25 cents? No, 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 no. If that's all you can get, I'll just wear it for another year or so. Well, that's it, neighbors. The owner has decided not to let the item go for the top bid, so we'll have to put it back in stock. But you folks, uh, be sure to join us for our next auction when another item actually belonging to Bob and Ray will go on the block. Bob lost one mitten during the past winter, and he has consented to let us auction off the other one right on this stage at our next sale. So please be with us, will you? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hey. Now then to Wally Ballou at the uh, Acme High Fidelity plant where they make all this high fidelity equipment up in Naugatuck near Saugatuck, Connecticut. So if you'd come in, please. Wally Ballou. Lee Ballou, Naugatuck, Connecticut with another spot description of heavy industry in Chun. Like, eat with the gentleman who has established the part of... And uh, uh, wait a minute, uh, engineer. Name, sir. Got to with no time at all. And so, as we walk over here, I want to chat with the uh, gentleman who is responsible for all this. When did you first start in the high business? Well, I was never quite satisfied with the commercial type of receiver... So back about 11 years ago, I decided to make my own. Uh, now, that there is a chime, just as it really sounds. It's a high fidelity chime. Would you like to hear cocktail shakers, high fidelity? Sure would. Okay, listen to them. That doesn't sound like cocktail shakers to me. Doesn't to me either. Not a bit does it sound like a like cocktail, 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 cocktail. cocktail. That's the only kind of sound hey. I want to hear right now. Now, 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 now. I got an idea. How about letting us hear the yeah, Quaddy head horn? The who? The Quaddy head horn. Oh, that's the one up at Quaddy. That's uh, we've recorded this courtesy of the United States Coast Guard. I mean, anything. Good. 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 That's... Oh, there we are. Let me have an onion in it. How about the quaddy head horn? Oh, okay, fella. <laughs> Eating off that is no good at all. This is Wally Ballou returning you to Bob and Ray. Well, where are we going to take our microphones tomorrow? Well, we have several surprises in store for you. And uh, we don't want to tip the show by telling you exactly. I'll just sum it up this way. It's a show that you will not want to miss. And that's the first half hour of today's Bob and Ray show with records, and we'll be back after five minutes of news with ten minutes more of same. This is Mutual, the radio network for all America. I'd like to take just a few seconds now to remind you that your druggist presents the Bob and Ray show every afternoon, Monday through Friday, over the station WOR, beginning at 5 p.m. And here in this area, the Bob and Ray show is presented by the members of the Westchester County Pharmaceutical Association and the members of the Rockland County Pharmaceutical Association. Get to know these druggists. You'll welcome the service they give, the late hours, the quick delivery, the complete up-to-the-minute products, and all the famous brand names. Yes, your druggist is always ready to serve you, so stop and shop at your nearby druggist today. This is WOR, AM and FM, New York. Now again, Bob and Ray. Okay, Bob and Ray on WOR 710 and WOR FM, New York. How you doing, fight fans? Hi, everybody. Back here again at the Bob and Ray show. You're a really big one today. <clears throat> Our chorus is just finishing up the opening number. Hey, do you know how stage. this song goes? No, I don't think you have to even think about that. It's about Billy Bra Okay, girls. All right, all right. Okay. And fine-looking group of young ladies they are, too, as they leave our stage. That was our big spectacular for today. Well, yeah. let's see. Do uh, you have a lucky phone call to make today? Or is that going to be later? I guess so. I'm just checking through my schedule to make sure that we're on time. Mm -hmm. Well, we're right on time. We have... Uh, I want to continue talking with some of our studio guests who have turned out to be such interesting people You are playing music because I like to dance yeah. around this time of day. Yes, we're planning to, uh, Webb. As a matter of fact, right now we had a, a record that we... Well, I was 
want to extend my congratulations to you. Says he wants to extend his congratulations to us. Um, my all the good luck in the world come your way. Well, that's very nice of you to say so. He said, may all the good luck in the world come your way. I couldn't think of what he said at that point. Gotcha. But it worked out real good. Here's that music you were looking for. Oh, good. <laughs> Westerners. Well, Slim, must be just about time to pull up and make camp for the night, wouldn't you think? Last rays of the sun had gone down over Mount Monadnock. Yeah, we better pull up. Yeah, there's a good spot right over here by the edge of this stream bed. Gee. Oh! I'm dying for some fiddles. All right, let's get off on the horse. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, we got off pretty easy that time. You did. I'm still up here. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Better take my left foot out here and then slide down. I'll swing here. I'll give you a hand. All right, here I come. Make it. No. I made it all right, except my right foot's still in the stirrup on the other side of the hog. Facing around the other way now. Just take it easy. Don't get nervous. All right. Push me back up on the horse. Yes. There. There. Oh, boy. Wait a minute. I've got to get my horse. He's wandering away. Come here. Come here. Come on. Uh, Don't go too far away. I'm still up here in the horse. I know. I'm going to help you. Listen, I'll climb up on my horse, and I'll give you a hand to get down. Then you can help me down. All right. There now. Ho, ho. Ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho. Oh, boy. All right, now. All right, your I, got left my foot out. I got my left foot out. Now swing around over back there and hang on your right foot. All right. Well, now Wait a minute, that's wrong. I can't reach you now. Then that's wrong. I'm hanging on the wrong side. Yeah. Oh, boy, I better get back up on the saddle. Tell you what you do, take both feet out. All right. And then you swing one of them over. You swing down the left side. Don't matter which one. All right, now I got both legs out of the stirrups. Yeah. Now... I'm sitting side saddle facing the left, is that right. right? Facing me, yeah. Now, what do I do? Uh, you just drop off there. All right. See how oh, we can get the rain around oh, the back. Well, uh, yeah, I'll loosen it for you. Oh. Get it off right now. Yeah. There. There. Now, oh, 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 oh. I'll tie up a horse. Well, wait a minute. i got to get off now. Wait. Let me walk around the left side of your horse. All right. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, oh. Nice, nice horsey. All right, now take both your feet out of your saddle. All right, I got out of your stirrups. Yeah, I got them out now. All right. Now just be sure I don't get caught in the reins like you did. That's right. We'll put around the horn like on the saddle. Yeah. All, All right. right. Now turn left. All right. Which yep. way? Wait a minute. Towards me. Is this left or right? Well, face me. Oh, all right. All right. Now jump. Huh? There. Oh, concern it. We left the. The vittle bag's up there in the saddle. Oh, it's all right. We can reach it from the ground. I don't know as we can or not. Wait a minute. Come back here, boy. Hey. Oh. Come here. Oh. Uh, ran away while I'm back. Oh. Uh, Smellorama has been forced to close down. They, uh... They uh, lost some of the perfume mm -hmm. that they were uh, displaying. You mean people were taking samples? Yeah, they ran out of most all of the samples. Well, that's what happens, see, folks, uh, when you uh, take things uh, in an unauthorized manner. It only hurts others now. See, Smellorama just will not exist anymore. That's it. It's right there in black and white. Jeez. Well, that, here's uh, a card just right now from Adelphi College. Out in Hempstead, Long Island, says, please stop abusing Webley L. Webster. We want to hear him play all of jealousy. Well, didn't we tell him yesterday that we would try and do it today? Here's one from uh, Reading, Pennsylvania. This is probably a complaint as to our treatment of Webley, too. Well, I think we've been pretty fair with him. I think we've uh, given him the benefit of the doubt wherever we could. Oh, hi, Webb. Oh. Prince, Mr. McGrath. 
Oh, you've got a friend with you, I see. I'd like to meet my attorney. Oh, I clam up. Uh, for... I'm uh, Bill McGrath. <clears throat> yes, sir. Attorney for uh, Mr. Webster. Like a little pre-trial examination, if you don't mind. Well, pre-trial well, examination. I don't follow this. Uh, just a moment, sir. Quiet, Webster. I didn't say anything, Mr. McGuire. Oh. I'm just standing here. Uh, let me read this statement. On or about the 14th of May, yeah. 1957. Yeah. The parties known as Bob and Ray did willfully and over the air embarrass my client, well, we Mr. Webster. It wasn't the 14th. Huh? It wasn't the 14th anyway. It was the 15th. Anyway. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Hey, listen, Mr. quiet, Webster. I didn't say anything, Mr. McGrath. I'm just Don't sitting here. Don't speak unless you say what I tell you to say. Exactly. You did willfully embarrass my client, <clears throat> causing him great uh, embarrassment and chagrin. Mm -hmm. and, held him up uh, to ridicule to the public, didn't you? Held him up to ridicule to the public. Right. I hadn't thought of that, but that's very good. I'll write that in there. Have you got a pen? Uh, yes, sir. Here just you write it in. How do you spell ridicule? Ridicule. R I D I. Quiet, Webster. I didn't say anything, Mr. McGrath. Boy, you got yourself here. a good lawyer. That's all I got to say. R I D I C U L E S. You see, Mr. McGrath, we figured this was just a little joke and that it would blow over. It's no joke, it's as you no notice joke. now. And a sum of $75,000. You're suing us for $75,000. You're suing us for $75,000. <laughs> oh, you're crazy. Have you checked out Dun and Bradstreet or anything? No, but I expect to do that a little later today. If you'll just uh, sign here, please. Wait a minute. I'm not signing anything until no, no. we talk to our own lawyer. He's in Philadelphia, but... Uh, we can get we... him here by next week. I'm That's sure. right. All right. I'll expect a call from him then. All right. Come well, on, Webster, and keep quiet. And there he goes. I guess he's serious, huh? Getting a lawyer Looks like he here. is, yeah. Well, yeah. We'll see what'll <laughs> develop. <laughs> Webley with a lawyer. Well, oh. Well, we Ho, ho. Do you have any music there? Good. As we look in on the Bessinger household today, Edna is resting on top of the birdbath in the side yard. Mr. Fessenden, the owner and operator of the Red Boiling Springs Movie Theater, enters through the front gate and joins her. Oh, it's you, movie owner and operator Fessenden. It was nice of you to come over so quickly. Well, I don't have much of importance to do during the daytime, Miss Edna. show doesn't start until 7. I don't even have to get the popcorn machine warmed up till a little after 5. Why, I can remember how much I used to enjoy the movies before I became an invalid. Yes, you used to be there for every change of pictures right up to the time you lost your marbles. Ha, ha! I understand they have talkies now. That must add a lot to the enjoyment of the picture. Or are you set up to show them here in Red Boiling Spring, Jack? Oh, yes. We've had the equipment to show talkies for quite a few years now. In fact, most of our current pictures are in color and on widescreen. <laughs> My lands. I'll bet Theda Barra is beautiful in color. Well, I don't believe we've had any of her movies since color came in. It's mostly Rock Hudson, Tab Hunter... People like that. And Richard Bothelmus, too, I suppose. I don't remember having shown a picture with him in it recently. Of course, I'm usually out in the lobby taking tickets. Sometimes I don't get to see the movie at all. Mm. I've always had quite a crush on Richard Bothelmus. Yes, I remember how you used to run down the aisles and throw yourself at the screen whenever one of his pictures was playing. Yes, I guess I was a silly, impetuous girl. Yes, I'd say that you began to show neurotic symptoms pretty early in life. But I'm sure you didn't call me over here to talk about that, Miss Edna. No, I didn't, movie owner and operator Fessenden. I really wanted to give you a small contribution. I figured that if everybody in Red Boiling Springs would give you 50 cents, you'd have enough to buy a new roof and new seats for your theater in no time. A new roof and new seats for the theater? Yes. I know that your business has been hurt by television and that you're too proud to ask for help. But I can see the theater out my bedroom window. Just the bare screen, no seats, no roof. It's a wonder anybody comes at all. Well, that's not my theater you can see from here, Miss Edna. That's the new drive-in movie at the edge of town. It isn't supposed to have seats or a roof. Then you mean you're not in dire financial straits? No, in fact, I plan to buy an electric gum scraper to use on the seats if business continues to boom the way it has been. Well, I certainly am glad to hear that everything is all right, movie owner and operator Fessenden. 
Your good fortune almost makes me feel as if I'm no longer standing in the gathering dust. According to your card, your name is Kermit Pinweather. Is that correct? Well, Kermit is just my nickname. My real name is George. See, what do you do for a living, Mr. Pinweather? I make road maps <clears throat> with mistakes on them. Mr. I mean, you, Goulding? Uh, Goulding, sir. You deliberately make road maps with mistakes on them? Well, of course I deliberately make road maps. Do you think that road maps got made by accident? Well, what I meant was, do you deliberately make the mistakes? Oh, yes. The mistakes are all worked out very carefully with the executives of the Blue Sky Oil Company. That's the outfit that I make maps for. Well, I recall seeing a few Blue Sky stations around the New York area here. In uh, isn't that the company that charges 75 cents a gallon for gasoline? Well, it's 75 and 9 tenths, really, but they make that 9 tenths so small on the sign that you probably wouldn't notice it. Well, uh, is it's Blue Sky... 76. Yeah, well, is uh, Blue Sky Gas really that much better than other brands? It isn't any better at all, really. It's just that Blue Sky is a small company. It doesn't have any pipelines or tank trucks. All of the gasoline has to be sent to the dealers by parcel post. And that runs the cost up pretty high. I see, yes. Yeah. That's the reason Blue Sky puts mistakes on its road maps. Mr. Noble is convinced that if people get lost, they'll drive farther and they'll buy more gas. But not blue sky gas necessarily, sir. No, but the mistakes are worked out pretty scientifically. Nine times out of ten, the motorist gets completely lost and runs out of gas right in front of the blue sky station. Gee, it's amazing that you can work it out with that much precision. Well, it's not too tough. You take our road map of Nebraska. The person who drives to the spot where Omaha should be finds that he's right in the middle of a blue sky station on the outskirts of Grand Island. You know, that seems like kind of a mean trick to play on people. And you take our Iowa map, it's really a masterpiece of simplicity, doesn't have Des Moines on it at all. Mm. It's just a little note down at the bottom that says, for instructions on how to get to Des Moines, ask your nearest blue sky dealer. Well, now, what do you gain by that? Well, the dealers are all primed, and the directions they give just take you to the next blue sky station. Sooner or later, you're going to need gas. Well, it sounds to me as if you're perpetrating some kind of a swindle here. But thanks anyway for dropping up to chat with us. It's my pleasure. Incidentally, can you tell me how to get to the elevator from here? Sure. Now, see, you go all the way down the corridor here, and then you turn to your left. Yeah. Then about halfway down that hall on your right, you'll see a door marked broom closet. Okay, what do I do then? Well, you open the door, see? It looks like the kind of a door that would lock behind you when you close it. Uh -huh. But don't pay any attention to that. You go inside, and you close it anyway. Then you just wait there in the dark until the elevator comes. Okay, I think I got it. And much obliged to you. Goodbye. Goodbye. For the many fans who wait for her on the radio, we Let's present travel. once again the interesting story, The Life and Loves of Linda Lovely, Girl Intern. Written for radio by Ole Olehi. It stars Marsha Van Allshot as Linda, Sherman L. Sturdley as David, with Hugo L. Summer Stopper as Uncle Eugene, and Webley L. Webster as Ricky L. Llewellyn. <laughs> Return to the van covered cottage on Honeymoon Lane in Rivers Mouth as David and Linda await word from Ricky and Uncle Eugene after they went to Fielding's hideout to try to talk him into leaving town. They don't know that Fielding has tied Ricky and Uncle Eugene to chairs and set fire to the hideout. And they have been trying to get the telephone operator to give them some. Well, hand me the that phone, would you please? Police. Would you hand me the phone, Dave? Someone help that way. But now. <laughs> Let me dial operator. Who are you calling, Linda? I want to call the operator. See if she's heard anything from Ricky and Uncle Eugene, eh? Here, hand me the phone now. Number, please. Uh, operator, this is David Lovely on Honeymoon Lane, River's Mouth. Yes? Uh... Our Uncle Eugene and our next-door neighbor, Ricky Llewellyn, left the house this morning to go to fielding my black sheep brothers and his cohort, Eddie, hideout. Yes? 
And we haven't heard anything. I was wondering if they'd contacted you. No, they haven't called me. How long ago did they leave? Oh, three or four hours ago. We're beginning to get worried. Why don't you call the police? I think they're open this way. That's late. good. Can you connect me with them in some way? Yes, there's some way I can do it. Would you hold on just a second yes. while I check over this board I have here? She's going to see if she can figure out how to connect me with the police. And that way, we'll be able to go right to Wait the... a minute. I think I've... this is it. Here, I'll ring this number. Hello? Hello. Uh, who's this, please? The police? No, this is Uncle Eugene. Oh, I'm sorry. I have the wrong number, operator. That wasn't the right plug. I'm sorry. I'll try this other one. Hello, McGaffigans. Uh, is this the police department? No. Well, I must have the wrong number it's a again. jockey club. Oh, yes. Well, nice to talk to you. Good. Thanks for calling. No, operator, that wasn't the right number. Well, you, do you know where the police station is located? Well, it's right in the center of River's Mouth, yes. Why don't you, do you have a car? Yes. Why don't you run down there and explain it to them? Meanwhile, I'll see if I can figure out this board. Good idea. Thank you. And so the operator suggests that David drive to police headquarters. Tomorrow we'll hear the inspector say... Now, when did you last see them? That's in the next exciting episode in the life and loves of Linda Lovelay, girl intern. Word Carr speaking. <clears throat> the McBeebe twins, Claude and Clyde. Oh, good to be back. Good to be back. To see you, to all, see again you all again and to, uh, and to uh, say, say hello, hello and how are you are you to your fans. fans. Well, hello and how are you? You were here just... Uh, a week or two back, what, what brings you to New York so soon? Bob, um, uh, for the, for the uh, uh, summer, summer season, season I'm, uh, I'm uh, putting, aside aside putting aside my, my uh, our, uh, clarinet. clarinets. You, you mean you're uh, not going to play music this summer, BB Twins? Well, well uh, uh, we're going, we're to, we're going play, to play uh, the bells, the bells and, and the cymbal. The I see, see what we've we done, we've, done. we've, we've uh, converted, uh, converted our, our station, station wagon, wagon, which said McBeebe Brothers Orchestra, Brothers on, Orchestra on, it, on it, to, to McBeebe Brothers, Brothers Frozen, Frozen Custard. Custard. Well, you're branching out into another line of uh, industrial endeavor, so to speak. Raisin, Raisin Toddy, toddy special. special. What? Raisin, Raisin toddy, toddy Special. special. That's what the Sounds sign good. says. Uh, you were playing in New Jersey, your last engagement. What happened? Uh, well, <clears throat> to, uh, to uh, put it, put it, it bluntly, bluntly, we were, we were a thud. thud. A bum. Bum. You didn't go over down there at Al's Bar and Grill, huh? That's exactly, That's exactly what happened. What we, we, happened. Went over, we went over Al's, Al's Bar, bar and, and grill. Uh, <laughs> grill. Over the whole thing, huh? That's right. That's right. Well, there were some, was rowdies some rowdies there. Some rowdies there. Some, uh, from, uh, from college, college, Princeton, Princeton and, uh... And they came they in, and, and uh, they, they didn't, didn't take, take uh, kindly, kindly to our, to our music, music and, uh, and uh, exhibited, exhibited their, their feelings, feelings by, by throwing, throwing us, around. us around. Well, I'm sorry. I hope that there were no uh, serious uh, mishaps. Seven cents. Seven cents. What? That's the rest, That's of, the rest, sign. rest of the sign. Under raisin Under toddy, raisin it says toddy seven, seven cents. cents. Gone up, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, everything well, has. Well, everything has. Well, good luck, and we'll look for your McBeebe twins and their orchestra ice cream wagon this Frozen summer. Custard. Frozen custard. Yes. Uh, wherever you happen to be. Just and listen for the jingle of the, the friendly of the bell. friendly bells and symbol. Symbol. Thanks, gentlemen, and goodbye. Thank, Thank you. you. It's, it's always, always a pleasure. A pleasure. It's, we're having a little trouble with our lines, friends. If you can just abide with us just for a few moments. Terribly embarrassing, I'll say. We're getting a flashing light now from the master control saying that the line is in good shape. Feedback, too, unfortunately. Now then, it's Doesn't time happen to big call shows. In Wisconsin, and our sports reporter, Biff Burns. This is your eyes and ears of the press box, Biff Burns, speaking directly from Loon Lake, Wisconsin, in an outboard motorboat, surveying this typical Midwestern fishing lake. Incidentally, I noticed that the outboard motor on this boat doesn't make any noise. And now it's uh, the sound man's day off. The gentleman you just heard speaking 
uh, is our interview subject here at Loon Lake, and I believe you said your name is Skylar Fickle. That's right. I live in Milwaukee, but I spend every summer weekend up here at Loon Lake when I well, go down to watch the Braves. Uh, to me, uh, uh, Mr. Fickle, the interesting part of your story is that you use your fingers and toes for bait. Is that correct? Yeah, I let a finger or a toe dangle over the side of the boat, and I really bring in some big ones that way. Imagine it cuts the cost of your bait way down, too. Well, I uh, had the picture of a minnow tattooed on each finger and toe. The original cost for that was about $20. But I save at least that much money every year by not having to use what is known as conventional bait. Well, why do you have to have a minnow tattooed on each finger and each toe? Wouldn't one or two be enough? No, you see, you use a different finger or toe depending on what type of fish is biting. Small toe or the pinkies fine for crappies, sunfish, perch, smaller fish. If I'm after pike, I go up to a middle finger or an index finger. Of course, the thumb and the big toe are what you need if you're going after the muskies. And the fish are really fooled by that kind of bait. Uh, yes, I wouldn't have believed it myself, but about five years ago, I was swimming in Loon Lake one afternoon when a six-pound pickerel grabbed onto my earlobe. And uh, it was my biggest catch of the season. It gave me the idea for using my fingers and toes as bait. Well, we certainly would love to see a demonstration of you in action, Mr. Fickle. Could you drop a thumb in the water and show us how you go after a muskie, for instance? Sure. Uh, since I don't need any tackle, I'm prepared to fish any place at any time. Well, Mr. Pickle has dropped his thumb over the side of the boat now, and he's letting it drag idly under the surface of the water. I can't promise any results, of course. The lake's been pretty cloudy all week. Well, it's your style that we're mainly interested in seeing. Wait a minute, I got a bite. Feels like a big one. <clears throat> yes, the fish just surfaced, and it's a big muskie. Mr. Pickle is attached to his thumb there. I guess that it's at least a 25-pounder, and I'd say you're in for a real battle, Mr. Fickle. Well, I just braced my feet against the side of the boat and pulled now, see? Boy, this is a strong one. Fickle is uh, hanging halfway out of the boat now. Maybe you'd better let him go. Well, I can't let him go. I haven't got him. He's got me. Fish is trying to drag Mr. Fickle into the water. Ow! Ow! I guess that about wraps up the story from here at Loon Lake, Wisconsin. And this is Biff Burns saying, until next time, this is Biff Burns saying so long. Ow! Back to Bob and Ray. Ow! Bob and Ray, television critic Crawford Paisley. I noticed you're wearing Bermuda shorts today. You're kind of rushing the season, Crawford, a little bit. Well, these aren't Bermuda shorts, Bob. This is my underwear. Oh. Yeah, I stepped in one of those uh, press-while-you-wait places on my way over here, and somehow my pants caught on fire while they had them in the machine. Oh, too bad. There's really nothing I could do but come this way. Well, I hope you don't catch cold or get arrested or anything like that. I was sort of hoping you might have an old pair of pants of some kind around here that I could borrow to wear home. To well, go I'm this way. sorry, I don't believe so. This is a two-pant suit I'm wearing, but I don't have the other pair with me. Well, I guess I'll just have to take my chances then. It's awfully drafty, though, around my knees. Well, maybe you'd uh, forget some of your discomfort if you just went ahead with your review. Crawford. Bob, I really caught a wonderful show the other night. It was a lavish spectacular put on by our station over there in Red Bank. Well, local spectacular is kind of unusual. I guess it does merit a review. Oh, I agree with you. I've never seen the networks put on anything more lavish. The thing opened with a fellow sitting in a chair behind a desk. Well, it doesn't sound very <clears throat> spectacular so far. Well, I think it does, Bob. Dave Garraway just has a stool on Wide Wide World. This fellow had a full-size desk and a leather chair with arms on it. All right, well, what happened next, Bob? Well, the thing started out kind of slow and informal. <clears throat> Excuse me, this fellow told a couple of stories about Congress down in Washington. Mm -hmm. I guess they were supposed to be jokes. I didn't get the point of them. Anyway, all of a sudden, out comes a bunch of actors dressed like Egyptian soldiers. Oh, it was a dramatic program then. Well, I figured it was going to be, but they just had the narrator talking about Egypt for a couple of minutes while these actors drove through the set in trucks and walked through some piles of barbed wire. Well, is that all they did? Well, that was all. I expected them to come back later, but they never did. Instead, they brought in an actor who was a dead ringer for President Eisenhower. And he put on a skit that the narrator described as a news conference. They had the stage all filled up with other actors dressed like reporters. Well, now, you know, this is beginning to sound this like... This spectacular was sponsored by a local meat market. I don't know where they got the money to hire so many actors. Maybe the guys who had taken the part of Egyptian uh, soldiers probably just changed costumes. I don't know. No, I think the explanation is that you didn't see a spectacular at all. That was just a local news show. No, they couldn't have gotten all those Egyptian soldiers to come to the studio. They must have been actors. No, nobody came to the studio. The soldiers were shown on what they call a film clip. It's like a newsreel. Gee, I didn't know anything about those things. I feel kind of foolish. 
If you'd show us your script in advance like we asked you to do, these things wouldn't happen, Crawford. Well, I sure will next week, Bob. You can bet on that. All right, fine. We'll see you then. Uh Goodbye. Hey, you in the polka dot shorts. You're under arrest. Wally Ballou reports that he's standing by with an interview with a toll house tender in Logansport, Indiana. So if you're ready, come in, please. Wally Ballou. There's the widely respected Wally Ballou speaking directly from the toll house of the Wabash River Bridge just outside Logansport, Indiana. The tender of the toll house is here beside me, and your name, sir, is Chester Quirtus. Is that correct? Yes, my name is Chester Quirtus. And to me, Mr. Quirtus, the interesting thing about your story is that you're a freelancer. I mean, you don't work for any state or local government agency, do no, you? No, and I don't own the bridge either. The only investment I have is right here in the toll house. Well, since it's not your bridge, sir, what authority do you have for collecting tolls from people who go across it? Well, look, let's be practical. Suppose you're driving along the highway and come to a toll house next to a bridge. Do you ask to see the guy's credentials before you give him the money? No, but I never ran into a crook like you in the business until now, either. Oh, get off it, will you? Sixty percent of the toll houses in this country are set up by freelancers like me. Actually, there are only about ten legitimate toll bridges in the whole nation. Naturally, I'm not going to tell on a nationwide broadcast which ones those are. I see. I mean, this is my bread and butter we're talking about here, and I'm not going to jeopardize it. Well, do you need any special <clears throat> training for this kind of work, or can anybody set up a toll house and start fleecing the public? Well, it helps if you have some experience in shortchanging people and acting like you're too busy to talk to them, that sort of thing. I got my training on the Lincoln Tunnel in New York. Well, that's a legitimate toll tunnel, isn't it? Yes, it's legitimate to charge people 50 cents to get into the tunnel. But you see, I set up a booth at the other end and charge them 25 cents to get out. Uh Uh-huh. Well, there are a couple of other things we wanted to ask you, but uh, we seem to be running a little short of time. What's the matter, Mr. Quirtus? Well, there's a state police car coming down the road. I've got to hurry out and change the sign. Change the sign? Well, that's just another little trick of the trade. I've had a special sign made up. On one side, it says, pay toll here. On the other side, it says, fresh orange juice. See, whenever the cops come around, I just change the sign. They think I've got a legitimate orange juice stand there. Oh, I see. Well, thanks for talking with us. And I must say that you're quite a human parasite, Mr. Well, it's nice of you to say so. Incidentally, if you're driving on north across the bridge toward Monticello, it'll cost you two bits. No, I'm not crossing the bridge. I'm going back to Logan's Point. Okay, cheapskate. Now, this is Wally Ballou sending it back to Bob and Ray in New York. Well, this is the end of another week here at the Bob and Ray Show. And uh, we may hear you, uh, or you may hear us on Monday. We don't know. Uh... Think about that. Think about it. Mm-hmm. And uh, until the next time, which would be uh, on Monday, we assume, this is Ray Goulding reminding you that... No, to write. Oh, reminding you to write if you get work. Bob Elliott reminding you to hang by be... No, hang, by hang by your thumbs. And this is Mutual, the radio network for all America. <laughs>